Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our weekday online webinar. My name is Christine Hammond. I am the Executive Director of the Long Beach South Bay Chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Today's program, Five Critical Roofing Performance Considerations, is presented by Sherry Carlozzi, Architectural Sales Manager of FiberTight, a Seaman Corporation. Sherry has been in the roofing industry for 17 plus years and has included sales team management and leadership in areas of single ply installation best practices, rooftop safety sales, and architectural support through relationships with contractors, manufacturers, distributors, design professionals, and consultants nationwide. Sherry is active in the American Institute of Architects, Los Angeles, and Long Beach South Bay Components, the LACSI, and is one of the founding members of the National Women in Roofing. She supports the principles of education, mentorship, networking, and recruitment. Okay, Sherry, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you, Christine, and thank you, everyone, for sharing your lunchtime with me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm looking forward to discussing the five critical considerations for roof performance with you today. Um, again, as a sponsor of the AIA of Long Beach and South Bay, I am privileged here to, to have this presentation with you. I love a hands-on presentation. That's why the polling questions are gonna bring some of your interaction into, into this program too. So I'm looking forward to that. So at this time, I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna share my screen and we will get underway. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can. <clears throat> yeah, awesome. You're good to go. Yep, yep. Very good. Well, today we're going to discuss the five critical roofing performance considerations for um, longevity of a roof and its, and its performance. And why is my, there we go. Um, a little bit about our course, we are going to talk about the five major performance criteria that, is, that affect the life of the roof, such as UV, wind, et cetera, and narrowing uh, this very broad list of everything that affects your roof, which is your fifth wall, your first, um, uh, your first source of, of protection of your building. And we're going to narrow all these broad list of uh, criteria down to the top five. And then we'll follow this by a comparison of the six major low slope roofing system types and how they perform in each of these criteria. This is a copyrighted presentation. And as Christine mentioned, there will be, it is recorded and you will have access to that at the end of this program. Let me tell you a little bit of something of what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk a little bit about my company, Seaman Corporation, then we'll go into AIA presentation, and then we'll follow with some um, follow-up questions and anything that you may have following this presentation. So a little bit about Seaman Corporation. Over 70 years ago, it had its very humble beginnings in the basement of our visionary and our founder. It has now developed into a $250 million company, family owned, that is vertically integrated in high performance fabric markets throughout the world. Um, we, uh, we do all our own proprietary knitting, weaving and coating in these two factory locations. On the bottom left, you'll see our world headquarters in Worcester, Ohio. On the bottom right, you'll see our Bristol, Tennessee location where we do all of our knitting and weaving. We do coding in both of these facilities. As I mentioned, in addition to doing our own proprietary knitting and weaving, we use state-of-the-art equipment to mix our own proprietary compounds for formula um, formulation of our coding materials. Um, we use a multiple number of wide width hot melt coding machines that are high-tech products to produce these, these uh, high performance coated fabrics. Some now reach the width of hundred inches and roofing is one of those. So we can produce different widths of this material depending on the use. As I mentioned, uh, we participate in a high range of very different 
uh, performance of uh, coated fabric markets. And we are either the leader or one of the leaders in most of the markets we serve. In the top left, you'll see our um, geomembrane, which is landfill liners to protect the earth. In addition to roofing in the top center, we also do air, air support domes, um, uh, de-icing containment and airports, as you see in the center, truck tarps, which we, or, which we started actually in 1958, one of our first uh, projects. And then we go into architectural structures as well as military. We are a provider for the US military, providing a bulk of the material that is used in the collapsible fuel and water containment that is dropped into the Middle East. Some of the harshest conditions of any product to face. So all of our years of experience that we have in these diverse fabric markets goes into every square foot of fiber type that we produce. So again, we are, we are coming on to our AIA continuing education and we are um, value our position as a provider for this for you. So at the end of today, our objectives are that you will be able to identify and discern between the six basic low slope roofing membrane systems, how they're installed, the options associated with low slope moving um, roofing membrane systems, um, the objective measurements behind the five critical performance criteria supported with each of those roofing systems, and how each of those six basic low slope roofing membrane systems compare when we look at these five critical criteria. And for your participation today, you will receive one AIA continuing education credit. So let's get started. So let's talk about the general low slope roofing systems. Principally, there are two different types of low slope roofing systems, bituminous materials, which are made up of built up roofs or modified bitumen roofs or single ply polymeric materials, such as thermo thermoplastics and thermosets. So let's start with our first polling question. When we look at, whoops, when we look at our systems that are available to us, we have the bituminous systems, single plies, liquid coatings and foam systems, and structural metal systems that are available uh, for roofs throughout the country. Which would you say has the greatest market share of all of these roofing options? We'll take a minute to get your response. Type your response into the chat, please. Sherry, it looks like about 90% of the answers are A, and okay. there's a couple that are choosing B. Okay, so let's take a look at what the answer is. If you chose B, single ply systems, you would be right. Single ply systems account for 71% of the um, of the national roofing markets with bituminous roofs accounting for 23%, and just 6% is based on metal, liquid coatings, and foam installations um, combined. So single plies now account for the majority of the system. is um, assembly list, optional vapor barrier, insulation, your cover board, and then you'll see your bitumen and ply sheets that are, that are, that are applied and um, then topped with an aggregate or surface coating on the top to protect it. So bitumen is heated in a kettle or tanker and then applied by mop or mechanical spreader. Systems are generally heavier and may need some enhanced 
structural support to accommodate the dead load on the roof. So that's a consideration. And that's especially true for those with an aggregate surface system on top of that. There are two basic kinds of, um, of bitumen. And those are asphalt or coal tar pitch. Now, coal tar even um, has is a known carcinogen and its use has been declining. The general trend in the market has been away from built up systems in favor of your white reflective or single ply membranes. Drivers to single ply include this white reflective nature, the fact that it's easier to install and easier to identify leaks than what you would see through your built up multi ply system where some of that could be hidden. So we'll talk about more single plies in a little bit, but um, as you can see, um, even though it smells like the asphalt that you see on the roof, it is on the, on the roads, it is very, very different. So here's, here's just a, a viewpoint of, of some of we see with some of that application. As you can see, it's a hot mop system that is put down and also can be cold applied as well. Let's go on to your modified bitumen sheets. So modified bitumens were developed in Europe in the 1960s when Europeans were concerned about the quality of performance of some of the um, roofing asphalt. They then added modifiers to replace the plasticizers that had been removed through the distillation process. The US started developing modified bitumen compounds in the early 1970s and 80s. Modified bitumen products are factory made composite sheets that are made of, of the bitumen, whether it's asphalt or coal tar. And the reinforcement, the mod bits, and that encompasses a variety of materials that can be differentiated between thickness, modifier type, and reinforcement. Most of the systems you'll see are, are, are like because they are a redundant uh, system that can offer a sense of security through its thickness. Although they can also hide imperfections and installation errors that can show up later on in the life of the roof. So there are two kinds, sorry, I'm right behind. There are two kinds of um, modifiers to make up modified bitumen sheets. One is APP, ectactic polypropylene, and the other is SBS. Um, and SBS is um, styrene, butadiene, styrene. This, this differentiates between the type of polymers used um, to the membrane that the SBS um, rubber has more, the SBS has more rubber in it than what you would find with your APP product, which has more plastic. So you see a lot of your SBS products that are used in colder climates and due to the plastic nature of the APP, you'll see the um, APP used more in warmer climates. I'm gonna show you a sample of um, installation of this on the roof. It is applied with a torch. So there's an open flame on the roof and it really depends on the ability of that installer to have a good application, even application on the roof as it rolls out. There are a variety of reinforcements that are used, including but not limited to fiberglass and polyester in that product. The modified bitumen used is a base sheet and a cap sheet. And most of the time there's some kind of surfacing material to protect the bitumen from harmful UV rays and for energy savings as well. Let's talk about single plies. So single plies were first introduced in Europe in the 1960s and later in the US in the 70s during the oil crisis. And if any of you remember the oil crisis, it was driving oil prices sky high. So um, it made built up roofs, the traditional method cost prohibitive or they weren't as effective cost price for roofing installations. So single plies came into play and that was a driving force with that. At that time, the industry considered single plies as a, rev as a different avenue to reduce cost and also reduce installation error that was you would find in those multi-ply systems. So there are two general categories for single plies. There are your thermosets and your thermoplastic. Thermosets mean, thermoset membranes can't be changed by heat. They are cured or vulcanized in the manufacturing process. 
Therefore, seaming the membranes together is not possible. When you have a thermoplastic, they can have their characteristics changed by heat. So seams can be heat welded in the field with hot air equipment and able to use that seam in the field. which is a thermoset. Here's your basic setup. And as you see, it's very similar. What you're seeing in all of these are, are adhered systems, but they all can be mechanically attached as well. So you see, again, your, your deck, your, um, your optional vapor barrier, your insulation, your cover board, and then your membrane. So a thermoset for EPDM is fabricated from polymeric materials that can be cross-linked or vulcanized together in the manufacturing process. And once it sets, it's, in, it's irreversible. So when that happens during manufacturing process, you cannot heat weld. So one of the ways that you can I think she might be frozen. I thought it was me. Okay. Okay, Sherry, if you can hear us, you're you're frozen right now. Okay. Okay, there we go. Now you're back. You were frozen Sorry there. That. That's so okay. I think, we were, I think we were talking about EPDM, which is vulcanized or cured in the manufacturing process, which means you cannot heat weld it or you cannot change the dynamic of the physical properties out in the field. So they're pretty well identified by um, the way their seams are, are achieved and, and I think she's frozen again. <laughs> Let's give it a second. Sherry, if you can hear us, you're frozen again. Can you hear me? Now, okay, now you're back. Yeah, you're freezing up a little bit there. Sorry about that. Mm. It's happening again. There we go. There we go. I'm not okay, you're back. Anything. Yeah, you're back. You're good. So your EPD, EPDM it has a nine by nine inch open weave uh, polyester reinforcement scrim in it. And that is to help with tensile strength and stability in use. Um, they range in a various um, range of sizes, the thicknesses from 45 mil to 80 mil. They can be mechanically attached or they can be adhered. And as I mentioned, that adhering is usually done with tapes and adhesives, no heat welding. Most of what you're gonna see with EPDM is a black product on the roof. And some of the trends have been away from EPDM toward that white reflective membrane, primarily due to the re reflective aspect and the more reliable heat sealed seams of your PVC membranes and TPO and key base systems out there. So um, what, we're, what I'm gonna show you here is an example of how these adhesives and systems are installed. As you can see, the, um, the tape is installed. It's, it's a multi-person process. So um, basically, you clean your seams, you put down and dry them off, you put down your tape, you, um, you, you um, brush it out with your broom to make it, make it smooth there, and then you finish it with the pressure of your silicon roller on the roof. So it is, um, it is a, it is a multi-person process, but um, that is because of the nature of EPDM, what is needed to put these seams down. So let's talk about the thermoplastic options out here when we think about ones that can be reheated. They're factory made sheets that can be applied on a job site using the standard um, systems the techniques, either fully adhered, mechanically attached, or ballasted. Um, they are fabricated from polymers, which soften when heated and then harden when cooled. 
So that leaves them open to heat welding process for providing that, that dead on thick seal that you'll see for water, waterproofing the roof. Membranes can be heated, welded together. Um, and that actually prevents a bond that is oftentimes double the strength of the initial layer of fabric itself. And I call them fabrics because all of your thermoplastics um, that we're looking at here are supported by a scrim or a some type of fabric. So while we look at them as a roofing material, it really is a fabric with a, a coating on top of that. So it's not just one or the other, but it's how the two of them work together that's important in its performance over time. So um, again, these are your thermoplastics can be heat welded and we're gonna go over each one of these at this time. So one of the things that we really like about these thermoplastics is because they are, their white reflectivity is great and that's wonderful for California's Title 24. Um, it's a much lower maintenance in the life of the, of the, of the service life of the roof, much more so than what you see with built up roofs or modified bitumens. Beauty is that there's no open flames on the roof. That heat welding is an electric process and it, and it provides that watertight opportunity. And be based on the fabric content of some of these products, some have more proven life than others. And we'll talk about each one of those now. So here's your basic TPO membrane assembly for an, an, an adhered system. Concrete deck, optional um, vapor barrier, insulation, cover board, and membrane. So TPO, originally known as flexible polyolefin, was first introduced in Europe in the 1991, early 1990s. It was then introduced quickly into the US um, and what as thermoplastic polyolefin. And what constitutes TPO can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, it's really how it's made but it is illustrated in the, in the standard of ASTM D6878. You'll see that most of your TPOs will have a polyester um, scrim or so it is an open weave. It provides, um, I think I broke here. Are we okay? We're good, okay. Um, it can be mechanically or fully adhered. It can be ballasted as well. It's a range of thicknesses of your TPO with a number of colors available. And those colors can be Title 21 compliant as well. So um, one of, the, one of the, the difficulties that we have with TPO is, is that um, there has been somewhat of an issue with TPO and how it's made and, and its resistance to UV as opposed to its fire resistant and being able to find that sweet spot in the middle where it provides both has been a challenge for TPO over time. So let's look at PVC now. PVC is one of the um, single plies, it's polyvinyl chloride. And those products were supplied to the US market from European companies. They first came out as unsupported materials and found those to fail. And that's when they brought in that fabric content to give it stability over time. PVC is a molecule comprised of carbon, hydrogen, and chlorine, uh, more than 50%, which is taken from salt. The first PVCs installed in Europe were in the 1960s. And then they entered the US market in 1970s. Because they have a long history in the country, you'll see that biomole membranes are really the first uh, single ply to, re to receive an ASTM standard. And that standard was ASTM D 4434 from the American Society of Testing and Materials. Um, that standard was published in 1985 and, and it has had several revisions ever since as, as we continue to grow our, our uses for PVC. So PVC vinyl roof membranes um, have a methods of way that they're produced, whether it's a strike through process, extrusion, calendaring, laminating, um, just a number, it can be a combination of, of both. But um, what you'll find is a finished PVC system, uh, membrane that is either supported by polyester or fiberglass reinforcement. 
It also contains vinyl resins, ultraviolet light inhibitors, heat stabilizers, biocides, pigments, and plasticizers. Some of the products um, are, were offered originally as large prefabricated panels that intended to help with the ease of installation on the roofs on the rooftop. In addition, vinyl membranes can be readily produced with a fleece backing for your adhered systems. And um, this enables them also to be installed over slightly rough surfaces or and, and be, a, be attached with a, a number of different adhesives. So some manufacturers will also put a top coat on their PVC products, but eventually it will wear off and then you're left with what lies beneath that to protect the roof. And as, as we can see, your vinyl membranes come in a range of thicknesses from 36 to 120 mil. Um, they're not just available in white, although white is very reflective, but other colors are available and um, efforts to um, adhere to Title 24 are made um, with every company out there. One thing I will tell you about um, poly, polyvinyl chloride is while on most of the reinforcement is an open weave nine by nine reinforcement polyester or fiberglass, there are some that have a denser uh, product category um, for those PVCs. They can be mechanically or fully adhered and ballasted on the roof. But the difference between PVC and some of the other products is the fact that PVCs have been added, uh, plasticizers have been added to the PVC to give it flexibility. PVC is a very tough and, and high molecular content, which makes it very rigid. So um, liquid plasticizers are added to give it flexibility on the roof. So those are what are added to the PVC, which can also be uh, its downfall in later parts of its life. Which brings us now to ketone ethylene ester or KEE. KEE is a vinyl hybrid. And KEE stands for that ketone ethylene ester and it's copolymered um, under the name of um, Alveloy by DuPont back in 1973. It's been used in roofing since the late 70s. And it's really known for flexibility, weatherability and general toughness. So in addition to KEE, it was blended with PVC to give it even more toughness on the roof. Only KEE products meet the ASTM standard 6754. Um, they range in thickness from actually 36 mil to, to 60 mil, that is incorrect. But their polyester fabric base is a much denser fabric content. This gives it extra strength in puncture resistance, uh, tear strength and movability on that roof for long-term flexibility and performance over time. We also have it's been seeing a lot now, and I don't know if any of you have seen this in some of your specifications, but PVC with KEE as an additive. This was introduced in the early 2000s as a lower cost alternative to the KEE based membranes out there. It does follow the more open nine by nine um, uh, poly fabric package within there for its um, durability, strength and tensile strength. They can be mechanically attached or adhered or ballasted, but this product does not have enough of the KEE properties within its polymetric, polymeric um, makeup to meet the ASTM standard of 6754. So you'll see a PVC with a KE additive more under the lines of a PVC 4434 um, standardization. Just, just a little differentiation for there. Um, they're relatively new on the market. We don't have a whole lot of information on that at this point to provide you with um, solid uh, results on its performance long-term. They are relatively new. So let's just look at some of the installation that we see with, uh, with the th your thermal plastics, which can be reheated. This is a heat welding. Um, handgun and that puts superheats the the airflow in there and heats up those molecules and then you follow it with um, the pressure roller and what you find is a is a product that gives you a more permanent weld on the roof. 
and it is solid one and a half inch well that you can see on the roof and on the lower end. So there is heat speed in fact, if you heat those molecules up, then it's going to move through the membrane to the second point, and it's going to follow with the pressure so that when it cooks, you have a dead on foot millimeter or inch and five eighths weld in the steam to give you your water tightness on the roof. So this would be a time where we would ask if you have any questions, but we're going to go into um, another polling question for you. So what has the greatest impact on a roof system's overall performance? Is it the installation, the cost, the system and design, or the forces of nature, such as wind, hail, fire, UV exposure, and pollutants out there? We'll give you a couple minutes to put in your responses. Please type in A, B, C, or D in the chat. Looks like we're kind of split between A and C, and there's a couple of Ds. Well, and you know what? And I can see why it took a little bit of extra time because this was kind of a trick question. But really, they all play a part in the success or failure of a roof system that you choose. But the five most critical include UV exposure, chemical resistance, hail, wind, and fire. So, well, you're all right with your answers, but the, the point is that it's more than just um, the design capability. It's it's the elements and it's it's uh, what the roof is exposed to after it's installed. So let's let's go over some of that right now. So this is where I would have my questions, which we'll save toward the end. So let's discuss all these things that can affect the roof. So when you look at a roof's performance, there is when there's nothing that can be evaluating two different roof systems than by looking at an old roof in your industry, in your climate, and see what's work. On-site performance is the telling tale. Lab tests aren't a substitute for real life experience out there, and neither are warranties. So let's let's talk about what could really affect that. When we look as as developers and designers, you and, and contractors, you can all look at this and say maybe it's the contractor, maybe it was the system that was designed, maybe it was um, maybe it was value engineered to keep the cost down, maybe there are chemicals that are involved in it or extreme temperatures or foot traffic for maintenance on the roof, clogging water, or just maintenance or general abuse. It could be any one of those things, right? So let's take a look and see, um, see what if we can narrow this down for that. So as we mentioned, the list of what's involved with the room can go on and on and on, right? But the question at the end of the day is, will it work, right? So what we're going to, what we're going to talk about now, are the list of what roofing consultants would say are the type of the top five performance criteria that roofing manufacturers have the greatest influence over in production. Now we're going to be able to group all of these and we're looking at these, but we're gonna we're gonna take a look at these individually. So let's narrow, let's narrow it down. Whoops, it's got a mind of its own to the roof systems against these five criteria. So let's let's take this. So let's start first with UV resistance because all our roofs are exposed to sun, right? Rays of the sun. So when we look at built up roofs with in regard to UV resistance, the UV rays break down the molecular bonds within that bitumen 
in the chemical change, causing those oils of the bitumen to leach out over time. In addition to those, mod those modifier, what happens with that is what we call alligator or cracking or crazing on the roof. So protecting that bitumen is important and it requires extra resurfacing, whether it is a liquid coating attached and that additional granular cap or aggregate added over, over the course of years to maintain the performance of the roof. So your built up roofs when it comes to UV resistance are more labor intensive and, re, and require more maintenance for the life of those projects. So that's what we look at there. Now here's some examples of a dried out roofing system doing, due to UV exposure. And as you can see where it cracks and crazes. And when you look at those cracks on the surface, what lies below are the felts, and that leaves an opportunity for a leak to develop from there. When we look at mod bitumen, modified bitumen, because it is a bituminous uh, um, process and it's a factory created sheet of those multiply systems, the, the results of UV are very similar. So the UV rays do break down the molecular bonds with the bitumen causing those chemicals to leach out or the oils to leach out, and that can also lead to cracking, crazing, and alligatoring on the roof. Protecting that modified bitumen requires factory resurfacing, again, like what you see with the polymeric sheet and fluid applied uh, coatings on the roof. This again is more maintenance required on the roof to maintain the life of modified bitumen roof when it comes to UV. When we look at our thermoplastics and thermosets, we look at the UV resistance to EPDM. So in its, in its earlier stages, UV uh, is, is good resistance with EPDM. But however, we know that this is a thermoset product. It is vulcanized in, this, in, in the manufacturing process, so we can't heat well the seams. And we have to rely on adhesives and tape to keep the seams closed and protect that roof. Well, over time, be reapplied over time. So sometimes you can use a ballast or a coating to pull down the surface of that roof, but it it does it does break down over time and it can really dry out those oils in the EPDM. So if you have an EPDM roof that is not ballasted, you run a, a greater chance of drying out those oils and uh, cause for, for earlier failure on the roof. Sherry, excuse me. There was a moment there where you froze and someone was asking what needs to be reapplied over time. Oh, okay. So. You may find yourself with the EPDM, I'll go back to that slide, that if it's exposed over time and, and it dries out the oils, you'll also see that it breaks down the, the polymeric or the, the effectiveness of those tapes and those adhesives. So that requires some attention and maintenance as well. So when you think about those adhesives that are added to them, that's additional maintenance that you would need for an EPDM roof. Okay. So let's, let's talk about TPO. TPO has stabilizers that are added for, for UV resistance. The difficulty Looks like you're frozen again, Sherry. Hopefully you can hear us. Maybe if you turn your video off on your end and we can continue to see your screen, that would help. There we go, okay. Your voice is, you're still frozen. Okay, sorry about that. Can you hear okay, me now? Okay, we can hear you now. Yeah, we can hear you now. Just keep I your video off for now, that'll be fine. Wonderful. So I was Thank talking you. about TPO and the UV stabilizers that they add into TPO for, to give it protection and resistance against the, the UV rays of the sun. The problem is, is when they add when they add that polymer, it affects the effectiveness of fire retardants in TPO. So it's tough, if not impossible, and it has been over time to find that sweet spot and get that balance of UV protection and fire resistance in TPO. 
it's almost like you have to decide which is more important to you, whether UV resistance is more important or fire resistance. Unfortunately, that seems to be what, ha what happens with TPO on the roof. So let's take a look at our next slide. Uh, and uh, here is an example of a TPO roof that is less than five years old. Most of your failures on the roof are going to happen at the seam first. So this is a seam and you can actually see the seam there where it is starting to break down uh, due to the UV exposure and dry out. So um, again, this is a TPO that is less than five years old. And again, finding that sweet spot between fire resistance and UV resistance has been very difficult for the TPO manufacturers to achieve. When we look at PVC, PVC has, is a very tough and, and, and um, dynamic um, high molecular content product. It's, it's very strong, it's very, it's very rigid, right? So um, what they've done in the manufacturing process for roofing is added a plasticizer that I mentioned earlier to PVC that kind of hinges the molecules there, making it flexible. Well, what happens over time to UV exposed plasticizers will migrate out of the sheet and they will leave you um, with the exposure there, which then leads to a brittle um, product that, that is prone to cracking or impact damage and making it difficult sometimes to repair um, failures on the roof or patch and repair on a PVC. So while that plasticizer is liquid plasticizer is there to add it to it, it doesn't stay. It migrates out of the sheet over time. That's why you see so many PVCs that are thicker. You'll see PVCs that are 60 mil, 72 mil thicker. The thicker the PVC, the longer it takes for that plasticizer to migrate out. It's not a choice of whether it's going to migrate out or not. It's just a matter of time of when that's going to happen. That's an issue with PVC. Now, if any of you are old enough to remember or had cars or grandparents that had cars in the 1960s, this will give you a good example of that plasticizer migration. Car dashboards used to be made of PVC. And in the summertime, especially if you lived in Florida, Arizona, Texas, California, when it was really hot, you would see the dashboard crack, right? And then you'd see the sticky substance on the inside of your windshield. What that is, is that's the same thing that happens. That sticky substance is that plasticizer migrating out due to the heat and the UV exposure. So that, that gives you some kind of comparison to understand that better. That's what happens with your, with your PVC. But PVC in itself is a very compatible, um, um, uh, miscible product, and it, it accepts modifiers very, very easily to UV heat, fire resistance, and, um, and it really mixes very, very well with these modifiers for its performance over life. But that liquid plasticizer is one area that of, of concern, which then leads us to KEE. And KEE, or the Elvaloy and KEE was actually originally designed as a solution to mitigate the plasticizer migration issue on the roof. So in your KEE membranes, the Elvaloy is an excellent uh, UV resistance. It, the UV stabilizers prevent that breakdown of that polymeric chain with that um, liquid plasticizer because the KEE in your, or the Elvaloy in your KEE sheet is a dry blend that kind of wraps itself around that PVC molecule, providing a permanence of that, um, that, that alveoli and the, the UV resistance during the, for the life of the, of, the, of the product. So again, like PVC, KE is a miscible polymer. It, acts, it accepts additives very easily and prevents that bond through that alveoli molecule to prevent that UV exposure. So let's, now we've gone over UV, let's talk about puncture resistance. And there's a lot to puncture resistance that's involved with not just the coating, but the fabric as well. So when we look at puncture resistance of a built up roof, when it's, when it's new and you have the thick plies, the mass is great. And so the resistance is good. 
But what we see um, over time and the consequences of a hail event uh, can be fairly evident in some cases with some of the materials here. Um, that over an age group, it kind of breaks down through the UV, the bitumen, and, and it decreases the ductility or puncture resistance in the roof. So I'm gonna show you another picture here. And here's an example that we can see what happens with the built up roof. Um, you can see here where hailstones have actually hit the roof here. And you can see that the granules have been displaced, but what's not so evident is the damage of the impact that is caused on the roof system as a whole. So even as the aggregate was moved apart and it looks like the bitumen is there to, to protect it. Um, and while it may look like it's okay, with closer examination, let's go to our next slide, you will see how it actually breaks down and creates micro fractures. And this is actually your plies that are now exposed in the roof. And over time, those micro fractures will get larger and eventually due to normal thermal stresses and expansion and contraction of the building, you're gonna have the start of a leak through your, through your modified bitumen. They're difficult to locate. Uh, if they're not as blatant as what you see here, they can be difficult to locate on on site. So while the while the thickness um, of the of the the system is helps you with impact resistance, the puncture resistance um, there is no real impact on thickness for puncture resistance on the roof through a, through a built up system. And when we look at modified bitumen, very very similar as I said with the UV. So when it's new, it's good through mass and the aggregate. But if you look at this hailstone and the size of that hand there, hailstone can be um, can be um, detrimental to your life, let alone your roof, right? So when you see hailstones that big, you have to look and see what's the impact of that. So the mass alone will not just protect the building from subsequent water damage due to a large hail event, um, and that's a misleading content because that mass might protect it, but it doesn't totally protect it. As you'll see here in the next picture, you'll see here a modified bitumen roof that has a coating on it. So it's an acrylic coating on that. But as it was hit by a hailstone, which we have looked to measure to be about to three to three and a half inches in depth that hit there, you'll see that it was no match for that hailstone and actually caused some cracking. Of, of the coating of that modified bitumen system. So even as that roof ages, that UV breaks it down, those oils leach out, increases the ductility. And while the, the thickness may be good for impact resistance, puncture resistance really doesn't have too much of an impact with the thickness of the modified bitumen on the roof. Here's a couple more examples that you can actually see where the hailstones have displaced those, uh, the aggregate on the roof and you can see where the damage begins there. So thickness helps with impact resistance, but it does nothing against punch resistance on the roof. So we look at our single plies, we look at that fabric package. And as I mentioned, most of your single plies, your EPDMs, your TPOs, and many of your PVCs have that open nine by nine uh, stitch per inch open fabric that is provides that um, reinforcement for the, the coatings of, the, of these systems. What you'll see in, in contrast is an 18 by 19 closed stitch, which is a denser product there, which gives you greater puncture resistance on the roof. So open weave, not as much puncture resistant clothes is more dense. If you are thinking, if you were to fall into a net, off, if you have a safety net on the roof and one was more open, you would, you would have maybe not as much confidence in the one that was more open than the one that was more densely packed and, and had a little bit more resistance to it. So it's a safety kind of parallel there per se. So let's look at EPDM. Um, some of the EPDM was non was non reinforced, so punch resistance was just terrible on it. Um, but it has its thickness does provide good dynamic impact. So what they did was they reinforced EPDM 
with that nine by nine open weave to help provide that puncture resistance and that elongation in the movement on the roof to keep it in place and keep it performing well for your roof. So as we mentioned, some of the thickness of EBDM can go up to 120 mil thick. The added thickness has an, as uh, con it, it contributes to that general impact resistance, but it has absolutely no bearing or very minimal bearing on the puncture resistance of this membrane on the roof. You can see here baseball sized hailstones that you see. Also here, you can see a scuff mark on the roof. And while it might appear that it's just a scuff mark, it, it really doesn't have much impact on it on the roof. While it does provide better impact resistance, it does break down the, um, the, the resistance over time for that roof. So couple that with UV exposure on the roof, you open yourself up for, um, for failures down the roof. Here's some more pictures of uh, some, some um, EPDM roofs. One you'll see that actually has a ballasted system. And again, when those hailstones hit, it's just, or even foot traffic displaces that and it exposes that roof to, to the effects of any kind of um, puncture or uh, impact on the roof. Let's talk about TPO. So when we look at, at TPO on the roof, um, it also, it also has that open nine by nine weave, which gives you um, puncture resistance. It gives you, reinforces the strength of the membrane, but it's not as dynamic as what you would see with a tighter weave product. So what this means is same thing we saw with EPDM, the thickness does contribute to the impact strength, but has very little effect on puncture resistance of the product on the roof. And how many of you have been on a roof when they've dropped tools and screws and walked on those on the roof and you can see micro tears and tears on the roof before you even finish the project. Um, resistant nature of your, of your TPO. When we look at PVC, most of your PVC fabrics are gonna have, also have that open nine by nine um, fabric package and some are more densely packed. When you look at the, the impact of the, um, the thicker fabric, denser fabric content, it's going to help you with your, with your uh, puncture resistance. And your thickness really is gonna only help you out with some of the PVCs with um, the impact resistance. So thickness has very little bearing on puncture resistance for PVCs overall. Here's an example of a PVC that has had UV exposure, it's had been exposed to rain on the roof, and now hailstones. So you can actually see the migration where the migration of the liquid plastisol for its flexibility has migrated out of the sheet and caused it to become brittle when these when these hailstones hit. When we look at KEE, KEE has that closed fabric package. Um, 18 or 19 by 20 stitches per inch. That densely packaged fabric provides superior puncture resistance of the product. So while your, your, um, your thickness, ha again, has very little impact on your puncture resistance, um, it does help with impact resistance, but due to the nature of the densely packaged fabric package of KEE is extremely puncture resistance. Here's another hailstone on a, on a KEE roof. I'm going to show you a, a puncture evaluation. This is, this is a, a test that is done with 60 mil TPOs to show you how many foot pounds of pressure it will accept before it fails. As you'll see that the PVC is almost twice that of your TPO, 60 mil. When we look at a fiberglass modified bitumen, it is 77 foot pounds of pressure. When we look at the, the polyester um, scrim reinforcement in there, you'll see it's slightly stronger. And then we look at a 36 mil um, KEE based membrane, and you'll see that the, the dynamic puncture resistance is almost 
a little more than twice of what you see with your um, greatest impact resistance from your PVC. So it's almost twice what you see there. And that is on a product that is about half the thickness of the other products. So that just reinforces the, the, the standpoint that thickness has very little to do with, with the um, impact on the roof. So let's let's take a look at hail. So when we um, about Sherry, sorry to interrupt. We're coming up right at almost one o'clock. So we oh. want to save a little little bit of time for some questions. Sure. Um, just if everyone can sit tight for just a little bit longer. Okay, okay go ahead. I appreciate it. Sorry, this took a yeah. sorry for the delays. But as you can see, um, when you look at hail. Hail, the, the faster it comes down, the larger it comes, the greater the impact that you're going to see. So you want to have a product that is going to withstand that. We've done some testing here that we can show you of impact of three inch to three and a half inch hail on a on a system against KEE from a from, a, from an uh, and uh, a water canyon from an ice ball canyon there. So. It is hurled at the machine and it shows you basically what would happen to a roof system um, during a rainstorm with hail on that system. Let me jump ahead so we can. And I think she might be frozen again. Um, Sherry, if you you're you were freezing up again. Yeah, I think she's is, is it just me or is she's frozen? You guys see? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, you're back. You're back. All right. So the chemical breakdowns of chemicals on the roof are not very kind to your modified and your built up roof systems. When we look at EPDMs, we look and see what's on the roof. Are we venting animal fats from, from kitchens or from food processing plants? Do we have the oils from your, um, from your HVAC systems which are located on the roof? Yes, we do. So exposure to some of those oils in EPDM can actually be detrimental to a roof causing that EPDM to swell and over time soften and deteriorate. This is an EPDM roof that is less than three years old that it has been attacked by compressor oils. You can see that it has swollen and it has failed on the roof. That's less than three years old. So not so, um, not so resistant to chemicals. When we look at TPOs, similar characteristics to EPDM, they're prone to swelling as well. So they're not really known for chemical resistance. This is compressor oil um, exposure of a TPO membrane, and you can actually see the scrim in that picture there as well. Um, so PVC itself, because it is high molecular content and because it has those, it's a very tough product, is good chemical resistance. Um, so the problem is, is the liquid plasticizers when they migrate out due to UV exposure over time. So some are better than others. KEE has inherent chemical resistance to a broad list of chemicals, and I can provide you with those lists if you want. But KEE, through the alveoloid component in it, is a membrane that is known for its chemical resistance. So it has great chemical resistance on the roof. Here's an example of a Tyson food processing plant. It's really hard to see the roof on that. But that is a product, that is a roof that, it, that has a very volatile environment. And there are very few products outside of Key that can withstand that kind of um, exposure and, and uh, chemical exposure from a day-to-day -day basis. So when we look at wind, wind is one of those things that, that we all have. And when, I, when we, let's, let's talk about wind, and I want to make sure that, that we have an understanding of wind that, um, when we think about performance criteria, it's one of the most important when you're designing the roof. Rule number one for any room system is really to keep it in place. So some keys to keep it in place, adhered, manically fastened, or ballasted, which is better. Um, there's a host of different options for you. There are 
there are thousands of options there for you available. But typically we see if it's a concrete deck, it's usually adhered. If it's steel, it's mechanically a fastened. So if we look at which is better, some people would say that with a mechanically fastened roof, you can actually see that you have the fastener every 12 inches screwed in place. With an adhesive, there are a lot of variables that could affect its installation. Was the adhesive stored properly? What was the temperature? Was it within the right range of the temperature there? What's the ad ambient temperature of when you're putting it down? Was there dirt present when you're applying those adhesives? And did somebody do a good enough job in thoroughly covering that sheet? So there's a lot more human error. And some people think that maybe a mechan mechanically fastened system is a better way of seeing that you're actually meeting the requirements of fastening for your wind effects. The problem is, is you really don't know until a few years down the road when you see how that roof is performing. So let's talk about wind and built up roofs. Built up roofs are actually have a better performance when you're looking at a monolithic deck like concrete or gypsum. What happens is the weakness of the peel of that first ply um, contributes to that peel of that. So it has fair to moderate wind resistance in, in wind effects there. Um, when you look at modified bitumen, when you look at, at, at the same concept, um, the polyester reinforced is usually can be many mechanically fastened. When you look at your fiberglass reinforced products, you're going to see that they're generally adhered systems. Um, again, a monolithic deck is always good for, for modified bitumen. It is a moderate to good wind resistance, but again, the weak the peel. And since an adhered system and ballasted systems are predominantly used for e EPDM, they may not perform as well as mechanically system uh, attached system. And of some of those mechanically attached system, it has that open weave fabric that is not considered a heavy duty fabric. So even when you add the ballast like this roof and you have a significant wind effect, you can see that it not only moves the membrane, but it moves the ballast as well. So it is not considered a heavy duty fabric when we look at for wind, can, wind resistance for mechanical attachment. EPO has a fair to good wind um, resistance. It is an open weave nine by nine um, uh, polyester scrim reinforcement that provides um, fair to good wind resistance. So when it's mechanically attached, it's not a more robust fabric. And so based on its use with ad adhered systems, the data on that is not as conclusive as what we see with mechanically attached. So I would say the, the resistance to wind is fair to good on a TPO. PVC, some PVCs, they have a heavier fabric content than others. So the, the resistance to wind is excellent on there. They have a proven history with adhesive. So whether they're mechanically attaching or adhering to that a PVC, especially one with a higher and denser fabric content is gonna give you excellent wind resistance. Here is an example of some wind testing that was done on KEE. And KEE based on its highly dense fabric content and its polymer coatings provides really, really good wind resistance because it has a proven history with adhesives and, and does very, very well because it is a heavy duty fabric with mechanically attached systems. PVCs were first introduced in Florida, which has some of the most, most um, uh, horrific um, weather conditions and then volatile wind um, events that we're going to see throughout the country. So it's performed very, very well in areas like that. So as you can see by this, this test here that it increases the um, wind exposure through the wind tunnel on that until finally it reaches the 165 mile, um, miles per hour on this and, in, and, in, and it pops. So it has very, very high resistance to um, the wind effects that you'll find with KEE. Um, Sherry, just to pause you for a moment. Um, we're about one, eight minutes after one. Oh. Uh, yeah, some folks are, 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 are having to head back to, um, to their uh, work positions. So we can continue, but if anyone 
has any questions that you want Sherry to address right now, you can either put it in the chat or um, raise your hand and we can call on you now and we'll just continue on for those who can, can stay. But if anyone has any questions right now that you want her to address, if you have to head out, um, just raise your hand, put it in the chat. Um, otherwise we'll just continue and um, we'll be sure to give you access to the recording um, so you can catch up on the remaining of the program. Um, but, okay. All right. I don't see any hands raised or any questions in the chat for right now. Um, okay. So go ahead, Sherry. Why don't you continue on and we'll keep recording and we'll make sure that this uh, everyone gets access to the recording. Thank you. Sorry about those delays for technical issues, but uh, we're close to the end now because our last our last topic is really fire. And I'm going to ask you a polling question about uh, UL 790 fire resistant testing for class A, B, or C ratings and what that is based on. Is that based on, oops, sorry, technical issues here. Well, I have technical issues on my end. So basically, is it is was it based on the membrane itself or the entire roof system? And the answer is B, the entire roof system is what um, the fire resistant testing for class A, B, or C ratings is based on. So let's go over that. So let me just tell you a little bit that fire, fire is is the destroyer, right? So um, let's go over the basics of UL versus FM testing. So for purposes of discussion, most people are more familiar um, with and most recognized with the UL. And UL 790 really is intended to measure the fire resistant characteristics uh, against fire originating outside of the building. And they use a couple different test messages, three specifically. One would be the, um, the spread of flame, the intermittent flame, and the burning and the burning brand test to give you that A, B, or C rating. When we look at spread of flame, what it basically does is it, it, it spreads the flame across the surface of the assembly and holds it there for 10 minutes. Based on that spread of the flame, a class A rating will give you uh, a class A rating if the um, spread does not exceed six feet. Um, a class B will be a roof flame spread that does not exceed eight feet. And, it's, and this is only test method required for metal, concrete, or port gypsum desks is the spread of flame. When we look at intermittent flame, this evaluates the resistance of flame penetration. So up to 15 cycles of two minutes on, two minutes off of direct flame applied to the deck. Class A represents no sustained flame under the roof or burning brands for 15 cycles. Class B, no, no burning brand or no spread of the flame for eight cycles. When we look at finally the burning brand test, that's based on the resistant flame penetration by an ignited ob object that it that lands on the roof. And then we look at wildfires in California, we can relate to that, right? So what they do is they take a dried out Douglas fir tree, ignite it on the roof, and class A represents no sustained flame under that burning brand with a tree that is when it weighs 4.5 pounds. Class B, class B um, is a no significant burning brands from a um, from a tree that um, that is that weighs 2.25 pounds on that roof. When we look at UL214, UL214 measures the resistance of the membrane only after the ignition site ha source has been removed. So we're looking at in 214 the membrane itself after and its performance once the ignition source has been removed. So UV and uh, on and exposure and over time, what you see with built up roofs and modifies is because it's a petroleum based product, it will burn. Um, you have the surfacing over there to uh, on top of your granular cap and your coatings to protect it, but it requires more maintenance to keep it covered. So as those as those oils leach out, it provides an opportunity for fire. So they are more um, they don't have a great resistance to fire. When you look at EPDM, it has a very poor resistance to fire because it doesn't have the um, inherent molecule chlorine to suppress the fire. 
the polyester scrim is not flame resistant and fire retardants don't um, attach well to the PDM. So based on UL 214, when the, when the fire is removed, it is not acceptable or considered combustible. When we look at TPO, TPO, as I mentioned earlier, UV exposure or fire resistance, one or the other, you can't get both with the TPO. It does not have an inherent suppressant molecule, chlorine, present in its makeup. Its polyester scrim is also not fire retardants. And so again, those fire retardants don't easily attach to that base polymer of TPO. So based on U, U, UL214, it is considered a combustible product and so there, therefore has poor fire resistance. We look at PVC and KEE, they both have um, chlorine inherent in their system. So that means that it burns slower and it can suppress that flame and actually cause the flame, uh, flame to extinguish. Those fire retardants as, a, as PVC and KEE are both miscible polymers, they accept those easily. So fire retardants are easily compounded with KEE and PVC. You'll find there's a great portfolio of class A assemblies associated with PVC and KEE membranes. And per UL214, it is an acceptable product and, uh, and performs well against fire. So I'm going to show you um, a, a video, a quick video uh, shortly, but when we look at TPO, PVC and EPDM, there are no fire ratings. Please remember, no fire ratings were just the membranes. The, the ratings or classifications are based on the deck, the full system, including the deck, insulation, membrane, and the incline of the roof. So it's not just the membrane to give you those ratings, but it's the entire system. Let's take a quick look. These um, KEE modified bitumen, TPO, and EPDM have been ignited with a flame source. And what you will see is once that flame source is removed, you'll see what happens to uh, these products. You'll see that the flame source is removed and you can see that the KEE has kind of stifled the, um, the spread of that flame. Uh, the, the flame has been, ex has been removed. The SBS continues to burn. So does the EPDM and TPO just to show you the volatility under flame of those products. So again, I apologize for any, um, any delays for technical errors and issues that we had there. But if anyone has any questions, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna stop sharing my, my presentation and answer any questions you may have.